Welcome back to Bubonicon 2021. Today we have a science talk by Cordelia Willis. Uh, so Cordelia, please take it away. All right, well, hello everyone. My name is Cordelia Willis and I am a forensic scientist. I have worked at a government lab in San Jose, California for almost 23 years, which is pretty scary. And uh, today I am going to talk about uh, genetic genealogy, which is a new way to solve crimes. And so kind of give you some background on how we've been using DNA and kind of this new way forward that we can use. So uh, we're going to go ahead. Hopefully this is sharing properly. Okay, hold on. Of course, it was working fine. And now it's being weird. <laughs> it is sharing. I can't see it. There we go. Okay. All right, so DNA, what is DNA? Um, it's deoxyribonucleic acid. The, one of the first things that people who start at the lab have to learn how to do is be able to spell this out loud for the record uh, when they testify in court, but then we basically never talk about it again. DNA is, as you've probably seen in the past, it's a double helix, which is like a twisted ladder. And the rungs are made of different proteins, which start with the letters G, A, T, and C, which is where the science fiction movie Gattaca got its name. So if I never can, if I'm having a hard time remembering what the proteins are, I just remember Gattaca and all, those are all the letters. DNA is basically a blueprint for your body. Um, and identical twins do have identical DNA, but they may look different depending upon the building materials that were available in the womb. So if you think about building two houses from the same blueprint, but one of them may have a lot of resources and the other one doesn't, they may end up looking slightly different. Now, DNA was first introduced in a courtroom in 1986. And the technology has changed a lot in the past 35 years. So we're going to talk about what we used to do and some of the things that we can do now. So there's kind of two different types of DNA. One of them is nuclear DNA, which is in the nucleus of cells. You get two copies per cell, one copy from your father and one copy from your mother. And this includes the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. There's also mitochondrial DNA, which is DNA that's in the mitochondria and the rest of your cells. And there's thousands of copies per cell of this mitochondrial DNA. Now, mitochondrial and Y chromosome DNA are not unique. So they're either inherited entirely from your mother, which is the mitochondrial, or if you're male, you get your entire Y chromosome from your father. Uh, so that's great for finding families, but not for finding individuals. So it's used a lot in anthropological and historical research, such as looking for Jack the Ripper or studying the bones of the Romanovs. Whereas nuclear DNA, it's unique to individuals, except as I said, for identical twins. And it's what's used in forensics and paternity testing. And the forensic testing locations, we don't look at all the DNA, we only look at particular locations. And those locations are specifically targeted to distinguish between individuals. So we're not trying to find a family, we're trying to find the individual that committed this particular crime. Nuclear DNA is located in all living cells with the nucleus. So that includes blood, even though our red blood cells don't have a nucleus. So our red blood cells actually don't contain DNA, but blood actually contains all these other cells. So we get DNA from these other cells, which do have a nucleus. We can also get DNA from semen, bones and teeth, saliva, hair roots. So if you yank out your hair and has the root on it, that has DNA, and then tissue and skin cells. So forensic DNA analysis is a multi-step process. It's not, you know, on TV, they put it in a machine and they're boom, they're done. Actually, that's not true. It's a multi-step process. And that process has actually changed over time in terms of what we're testing for and how we do it. So it started with RFLP, which is restriction fragment length polymorphisms. That's what was used in the OJ trial. So that was kind of the, the countries in the world's introduction to DNA in the courtroom was the OJ trial. And when they did the DNA, it looked like this. It looked like gels and things were separated with ladders. 
Now this required lots of starting material. You had to have a blood stain that was about the size of a quarter in order to do this. It took a long time to process, approximately six to eight weeks, just to do the actual science of it, not to do all the paperwork and everything else that goes with it. And it was not good with mixtures. If you had a mixture of two people's DNA, you really weren't gonna be able to do much with it. So then they said, okay, why not use DNA's properties to make copies of the areas we're interested? So we're like, let's make in copies. So they came up with this PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. And in that case, if this is a dime, that little speck is the size of a blood drop that you would need in order to use this, this polymerase chain reaction or PCR to develop your DNA. And that's because we're making copies of it. So we don't have to have a lot of starting material because we're gonna make copies and analyze those copies. So this was quick and easy, but it was not as specific as the RFLPs and it was still not good with mixtures. So then they looked and they said, well, in other areas of science, they look at the short tandem repeats or STs, STRs, which are also known in other areas as microsatellites. And this is where you've got short little phrases. So remember we have GATICA, G, A, T, and C are our proteins. So we have a combination, something like A, T, C, T. And then that short phrase is repeated in tandem over and over. And so you can have multiple copies of this particular repeat. And what we end up doing is essentially we're counting how many repeats we have. So that's what the testing that we do right now at the crime laboratory, that's what it is. We're doing something that's going to be counting these repeats. So we end up with numbers as our values. So STRs are more specific. So what we do is we now use that PCR technology to make copies of the STRs. So that's what we do. We make copies. And now this is a relatively quick process. So the actual science of it takes two to three days. Now, it coming into the laboratory, being processed, all of the paperwork, et cetera, is going to take much longer than that. But the actual science process of getting the DNA answer only takes about two to three days. You don't need much starting material. So like those PCRs, you just need a little speck of blood and you can still get a full DNA profile. And this process can deal with mixtures. Now, we're not going to talk about mixtures today, but uh, just know that this process actually can deal with mixtures. So this is an example of what our DNA results look like now. So they're numbers, and we have two numbers because one is from your father and one is from your mother. We test at our lab for 21 autosomal or non-sex chromosome DNA STR markers. We also test for three markers that involve genetic sex. So these are markers that are actually testing things on the Y chromosome. So if you do not have a Y chromosome, if you were not born with a Y chromosome, you will have a zero at this location or an XX, depending on which thing you're looking at. We can also do additional Y-specific DNA. Um, if we have a case where we have a mixture of several males, we can actually do Y-specific DNA to get additional information out of that. But that would be an additional process to our regular process. This is what we normally get. So a single source profile, you're only going to have one or two different alleles per locus, as I said, because you're going to get one from your mom and one from your dad. And a match, here I've, I've um, highlighted, we have the saliva on the cigarette butt and Bob Smith, and all of these alleles or those numbers are identical. And so that's considered a match. And then statistics are given as to the random match probability, which is the probability that a random person off the street would match the DNA by chance alone. So that's how the statistics are given if you have a single source profile with DNA. That's great. If you have a suspect, you run the DNA, or you know, you run the DNA from the evidence, you run the DNA from the suspect that matches or not. But what if you don't have a suspect? Well, so we started a DNA database, CODIS, which is the combined DNA index system. It was established by the Federal DNA Identification Act of 1994. And what happens is local labs enter stuff at the local DNA index system level. 
then they get sent out to the state level, and then those values get sent up to the national level. And so things get searched every single week uh, at all three of these levels. So the profiles that go into the CODIS criminal database include forensic unknowns and mixtures from the crime scene believed to be from the suspected perpetrator. So if it's something that we think is from the victim, that's not gonna go into here. Now we may not know at the time if it's a victim or a suspect, but we're not gonna purposefully enter something that we know is from a victim. And if we realize later it is from the victim, we take it out of the database. We also enter in convicted offenders, their DNA, in some states, we enter in the arrestees, and there's a separate database for missing person searches. So if there's a crime, it's not gonna be searched against um, the missing persons. It's only gonna be searched against a criminal database. What's not in the CODIS criminal database are, as I said, victims, witnesses, consensual partners, families of missing persons, et cetera. So the missing person stuff is done in a separate database that's also run by the federal government. Um, and these other things just don't go in at all. So if there's a match, which means all the alleles match, as we saw um, earlier, if it's a match to a convicted offender or to an arrestee, the state lab is going to confirm the name before releasing the name to us. And then our lab still requires another sample from the suspect so we can test and compare it ourselves. What if there's a match to a forensic sample? Well, then the two labs or agencies will share information on the two involved cases. And knowing that the same person was involved in two cases can help you solve the crime. So what if the suspect isn't in CODIS? Maybe a near relative is. So DNA of relatives, each child receives half its nuclear DNA from its mother and half from its father. So parents and children and siblings will have more similar nuclear DNA than they will to strangers. For similar reasons, other family members also will have more similar nuclear DNA than strangers. And of course, all paternally related males will have the same Y DNA because the Y chromosome is being handed directly down from male to male, genetic male to genetic male. So familial searches in the state CODIS database, they only can match up to second degree relatives. So what's highlighted here, um, if you have a parent or a child that's in the CODIS database, if you have a sibling, if you have a grandparent, a half brother, half sister, grandson or granddaughter, niece or nephew, uncle or aunt, all of those, if you have someone like that in the, the state CODIS database, we might be able to um, find the person, but only those particular really closely related people. Currently, only 16 states allow these sorts of familial searches in the database. Now, California, Arizona, Colorado, and Texas do, but New Mexico does not. So I did not know that until I looked that up for this particular talk. Um, it requires a complete single source male forensic unknown profile, plus they have to do that additional YSTR testing. So if the suspect is a female, we can't use this, this familial searching at all. We can only do it if it's male. It must be an unsolved case involving an active violent perpetrator. So this is not to go after check fraud. This was to go after you know, active um, assaults and sex, sexual assaults, attempted murder, murder, things like that. And they must have exhausted all other investigative leads. So what if a near relative is an ENCODIS, right? So we said, if it's ENCODIS, great. If a near relative is ENCODIS, that's great. What if they're not? Well, maybe DNA from relatives is available elsewhere. So genetic genealogy is the use of DNA to infer familial relationships. And it's offered to consumers through things like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. They're looking for relationships, not uniqueness. So a totally different type of DNA testing, which is called SNPs, is used. So whereas we're looking to try to find the individual that committed a crime, here you're trying to find what families you're from. So they're looking at different parts of the DNA. 
saliva must be submitted to these companies due to privacy concerns because they don't want you to surreptitiously be like collecting samples from people and doing their DNA. So they require you actually spit into a cop so that people know that they're actually giving their DNA to this. Um, so that means no crime scene samples can be submitted because it's not like we're going to have saliva lying around at a crime scene. However, consumers can then upload their digital results to public databases such as GED Match and Family Tree DNA. So let's say someone in your family did Ancestry dot com and someone else in your family did 23 and me and you're like hey we want to combine our results well then you can take your results and upload them to this public database so they can see across the different platforms but it's a public database which means that law enforcement can now upload their crime scene results as well so what's the difference between genetic genealogy and familial searching? Well, genetic genealogy only searches public genetic genealogy databases, not the criminal databases. It uses these SNP profiles instead of STRs, which can detect genetic relatedness at a far greater distance than the STRs. And this is additional DNA testing that must be performed outside of the crime lab. So if the crime lab wants to do this genetic genealogy, they have to send it out and have someone else do this additional testing. And it's pretty costly to do. So they're not gonna do it on most cases. But then the genetic genealogy can use existing family trees from traditional genealogy sources like ancestry.com to speed up that tree building and case solving. So whereas CODIS can only match people up to second degree relatives, the genetic genealogy can match up to ninth degree relatives. And so we can look all the way back. So you don't have to have someone really close to you that's done this. It can be someone that's relatively far away on your family tree and we can still get some hits. So how does it work? Well. So the report may indicate that the crime scene sample or CSS is closely related to three people in the database. So Mary B is a sixth degree relative of CS, of the crime scene sample. Whereas P took is a sixth, also a sixth degree relative of the crime scene sample. And it so happens that Mary B and P took are third degree relatives to each other. So that's gonna narrow down who this can be. In addition, Bilbo Baggins is a sixth degree relative of the crime scene sample, but is not a blood relation to Mary B or P. Tuck. So then what they're gonna have to do is look at all these very complicated family trees and try to figure that out. So here we have a family tree. We have Mary Doc Brandybuck is a sixth degree relative to Frodo Baggins. Peregrine Took is also a sixth degree relative. Mary and Pippin are, are third degree relatives to each other, their first cousins. Then you have Bilbo, who's unrelated to Mary and Pippin, but is a sixth degree relative of Frodo. So Frodo is the only person on this whole family tree that's going to actually match up to all of those relationships that the um, processing found. Therefore, per genealogy, Frodo Baggins must be the culprit. At that point then, further testing is required. So now we need to acquire a sample from Frodo himself and do the STR testing, which is that uniqueness testing that we do within the crime lab in order to confirm it. We can't get an arrest warrant until a DNA match is confirmed. So what happens you, is you have to obtain a surreptitious sample and test with this STR. So, you drink your soda at a uh, fast food restaurant, you throw it in the trash, the detective that's following you takes that out of the trash, we test the DNA, we find that it matches, and then we get the arrest warrant and get in a reference sample taken directly from Frodo and we can match it up. So the first case that this was used and that made all the, the headlines was the Golden State Killer here in California. It was the first case to use this technology he was believed to have committed 50 rapes and over 12 murders within a 10 year span. He was finally arrested in 2018 and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. The first case from my laboratory was the 1973 murder of a Stanford graduate. She was strangled with a scarf, her body found miles from campus. 
It went unsolved for 45 years. They submitted a sample to the same lab as the Golden State Killer Lab in 2018, and they identified a guy as the potential suspect. When they looked into his history, at the time of the murder, he worked as a private security guard in the town where she was killed. He was previously convicted of murder and rape in Germany in 1963, previously convicted of raping an underage girl in Palo Alto, that same town in 1975. And so then he was arrested for this crime in 2018, but his trial is actually pending, waiting for the California Supreme Court to rule on the possible Fourth Amendment violation. So they're arguing that your own DNA can't testify against you. So this is where the future is going to be. What's our, um, how is the Supreme Court going to rule on that? Can your own DNA sort of testify against you? So that's my presentation. Um, this is my email address. And I'll leave that up for a moment. And then um, we have a few minutes, we have about three or four minutes to take any questions. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. So, all right, do you guys have any questions? So I have one. This is Mariana. Okay. Are all 50 states participating in the federal database? Um, yes, so all 50 states do participate in the federal database. Um, it, it, as I said, it started, I think, in, what did I say, 91? Maybe I didn't say. Anyway, it started like um, either late 80s or early 90s. Um, at first, only states put in, uh, different states could put in different things. So some states only put in people convicted of murder, um, whereas other states put in basically anything. Um, and then it's changed over the years, but, but all 50 states do participate, but different states put in different things. And some states do put in arrestees. So if you're arrested for certain kinds of crimes, your, your profile will be put in. If you're later found not guilty of that crime or the charges are dropped, um, then they can apply to actually have that removed from the database. All right, other questions? So it all seems very different from what it's like in TV. So what is your TV right. like pet peeve of what, how, how they <laughs> represent your job? <laughs> uh, my pet peeve with TV is uh, how serious all of the uh, crime scene people are, except for Abby on NCIS, which I don't watch any of the shows, but all these people are always saying, you totally remind me of Abby from NCIS. And I think it's because she's the only person who's not like super dark and serious. Uh, in the very first episode of CSI, which I watched and then haven't watched since, um, they Grissom said, you know, cops lie and, and detectives are blinded by personal prejudice, but science never lies. Or I guess cops are stupid, but science never lies. And I was like, okay, that's not the super, I mean, we take our jobs very seriously, obviously, but if we're working on a sexual assault case, we are literally looking at used condoms all day or people's dirty underwear, you know? So it's not, it's not super glamorous like you see on TV. And we do have a sense of humor about it. I mean, you kind of have to, because we're dealing with really terrible things. You know, we're dealing with people committing the worst crimes you can commit on other people. And so we have to have some distance and humor is one of the ways we can kind of keep that distance. Um, and so I, and I think the humor is what's missing from TV shows is that, you know, not that we're yucking it up all the time, but, you know, kind of like there's ER and all of those very serious TV shows. And then they made Scrubs, which was a comedy about doctors. And I kind of feel like um, I had joked one time that we should do a half hour comedy show that's about crime scene people um, because it, you know, that's, that's the thing you, you have to have, you have to be able to keep some distance. And so that's, that's my biggest pet peeve. Now the science, it's like, whatever it's science, you know, I mean, hopefully people don't believe it's completely true, <laughs> but um, one of the examples I used to give when I give talk in schools is I would tell the high school kids my life is as much like 
CSI as your lives are like High School Musical. Now we all know High School Musical is not real, but High School Musical has lockers, they have extracurricular activities, they have classrooms, but it's not what real high school is like. That's the same thing with CSI. You know, we're dealing with all of the science, but it's not, the science is different. It's way more complicated than you're gonna see on a TV show. So that's probably my biggest pet peeve. And that's why I watch shows like High School Musical, the musical, the series, instead of watching cop shows and, and science shows, so. I love High School Musical, the musical, the series. So oh, I appreciate that. Yes, oh my God, <laughs> two more episodes left, anyway. <laughs> so thank you so much Cordelia for coming and explaining this all to us I know I learned something I didn't know about the databases that was that was really yeah. uh, interesting so so thank you so much uh, for taking the time to come here with us uh, and for everyone viewing uh, please stick around you know for what we have next here at Bubonicon 2021 thank you thanks